All right. Um, super excited to be here chatting with all of you. On um, it's my first community day. I haven't uh, been to one of these before, although I'm an AWS community hero. And um, excited to chat with you about this experimental architecture that I've been playing with and that we're working with at my company called Serverless Inc. And I'm just going to hold this slide here because I told John that I'd use the AWS Community Day template and stuff. And I want to make sure he notices that wherever he is. Modified it a little bit to be a little bit more red, of course. Um, and real quick, I, I wanted to share something that's related to this talk. but. I added, I added this slide in really quickly when I was listening to Jeremy's talk around his image recognition or image misrecognition situation, where a lot of things were getting categorized incorrectly. Um, last May, I did this, this crazy talk, this like super over-the-top architecture, the most multi-cloud thing that probably has ever been built, where a photo was uploaded to AWS S3, and then that was routed through an event router to about 11 different serverless functions on 11 different serverless providers. And every single one of those used their respective image recognition technology to analyze what was in the image. And then we used Twitter as an event log, and it dumped out every single one of these functions, um, saved their, the image that they processed and what they felt was in, in the image to Twitter. And you could see this huge, long feed. But it was hilarious because all of them had a lot of misrecognitions uh, in the talk. And if any of you are fearing the AI takeover, uh, just watch this talk and you'll, you'll feel a lot better. <laughs> My favorite was uh, Watson. It looked at a scooter and it said, oh, laser guided missile. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine in the future if we're living in a world where AI is just everywhere and it's categorizing scooters as a laser guided missiles? That's like so many things can go wrong there. Um, anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun, super over the top, but, uh, but it's, on, it's on YouTube. It was at uh, KubeCon in Copenhagen. Um, I'm Austin. I, I created a popular open source project back in 2015 uh, called the Serverless Framework, uh, and the Serverless Framework has become the go-to tool for building serverless architectures. Um, there's a massive community behind it. We just hit 25,000 stars on GitHub. Never would have thought we made this. We would have made this much progress back in the day. I remember, like the first time I posted it to Hacker News, someone said, "This is a horrible idea." Like, what are you thinking? And no one was saying serverless at the time. It was just, you know, I I looked at Lambda and I said, "This is the future of compute in the cloud." Like, this is absolutely the natural evolution of the cloud. A whole bunch of stuff can be built on this. People just need the right tool to show them the way. So that inspired the serverless framework. Um, again, just hit 25,000 stars on GitHub, massive community. 90, over 90% of all work on the framework is done by open source contributors, and it's been that way for the last year. So super excited about that. Uh, and from that, I uh, founded a company called Serverless Inc. We make everything uh, teams need to build and operate serverless architectures. Um, so if that's of interest to you, you know, feel free to go to serverless.com or just, uh, just tap me on the shoulder. Uh, all right, so introducing the serverless architecture. How many people are doing serverless things today with Lambda? Ooh, that's a lot of people. Cool, awesome. Um, well, this is kind of the new, the new cool thing, right? Uh, it's this idea where we're building um, applications on top of these high-level services, and we don't really have uh, virtual machines, you know, server infrastructure anymore. At least AWS is managing all that stuff. We just simply focus on using all these services and kind of gluing them together via these stateless functions called AWS Lambda. But if your goals are to move fast, innovate more, and build software and applications with the least amount of overhead, this is absolutely the best option in town. So if that's really important to you, you've you got to reach for this thing first because it's really going to help you. Um, and serverless, you know, we, the way we define it is those servers exist, the developer doesn't have to think about it, right? And serverless qualities are usually things that are services that are auto-scaling, paper execution, and require very little administration. So anyway, this is the serverless architecture. Fantastic for so many reasons. Uh, Backend APIs, generally general microservices, um, any type of event-driven automation, data processing pipelines, voice bots, chat bots, um, all types of stuff. When you when you uh, when you take away overhead, you liberate productivity and you liberate creativity. I see teams every single day provisioning hundreds of functions, doing all types of cool stuff with serverless architectures, and it's great. However, these architectures can get quite messy. They're filled with all these independent units of things, and you're stitching a whole bunch of stuff together. It's a very kind of hairy architecture, and probably few know that better than me because I've been building this serverless framework for years, 
that basically is trying to abstract all the complexity of provisioning these things, handling permission management, and wiring it all up together. So you don't have to think about that. You could just go home, write some code, run serverless deploy, and have your, your vision, your, your meaningful thing be deployed within seconds. Um, but there's a lot of stuff you have to be concerned in this type of uh, about in this type of architecture. You know, API gateway. You know, what permissions does that require? It has its own stages concept. If you if that's a value to you, lambda. Every single lambda function has its own permissions model. Um, there's an alias feature that you could also use for st uh, staging. Uh, there's dead letter queue settings in your AWS lambda function in case the lambda function is down. Um, DynamoDB. Uh, you may want to hook up streams if you want to connect that to another lambda function. All these things are kind of stitched together, and in that, just with that whole architectural premise, other, uh, comes a lot of complexity. So, um, great architecture, a lot of challenges still, and then that's just putting it together, and then the, a lot of questions arise as to how do you actually observe this thing? How do you do root cause analysis? I mean, um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of complexity here. Uh, also, uh, Modern organizations, um, this is what I see a lot. I see you know, a lot of silos uh, focused on different domains. So there's you know, your developer groups, your operations teams, your marketing teams. And however, this can also get quite messy. A lot of these teams are in silos. They never talk to each other. Um, they have a hard time coordinating things. They need things from each other, um, but because they're in their respective silos, uh, it's hard for them to get those things. And a lot of this is about data. A lot of this is about information at the end of the day. So in this architecture, I'm raising these problems because in this architecture, what inspired this architecture is focusing on these two problems. It's technology, it's simplifying the serverless architecture, and it's also focusing on cultural issues around teams. And a lot of these people, they have great intentions and they want to do exceptional work um, but they just can't get the information, the things they need from other teams, especially around data, to just go take initiative and make something based on that information, that data. So, introducing the serverless red architecture. Uh, perhaps the solution to these two things, um, this is just something we're experimenting with right now, uh, but red is for reactive and event-driven, and of course this whole thing is built on serverless infrastructure, so we could build a reactive event-driven architecture with the least amount of overhead. <clears throat> Um, in this architecture, all data is expressed as events first. Anything that could happen is an event. And I'm really going to push the limits of that in this demo, um, which I'm going to do later. And all these events must be easy to access, analyze, and act upon. Uh, people should be able to just reach out, grab these events, and write code to react to them, to respond to them, whether they're analyzing them, whether they're acting upon them, or building their own type of automation. Um, it's really just an event-driven architecture at the end of the day, uh, with one kind of big, big substantial difference, and that is you have this event router, uh, which all the events are funneling through. And this is kind of what we're going to use to simplify that whole serverless architecture that I showed you earlier that has a whole bunch of things that are all glued together. Um, in this, you simply have connect sources, anything that could uh, publish events uh, to the event router, and the event router is going to pass them through to uh, any type of sync. Could be functions, could be AWS Lambda functions, could be AWS Kinesis, could be uh, Redshift. Um, and with this, we could solve a lot of problems across a lot of domains. So first off, we could build our applications and handle our basic application logic this way. You know, take a user-created event, write a function to react to that. Uh, you could do analytics, uh, tracking, kind of um, business intelligence, marketing stuff with this, with this event-driven architecture. So if a visitor visits your website for whatever reason, that should be exposed as an event which you could write code to react to. Uh, DevOps tasks, um, if someone created a new deployment, that should also be expressed as an event so someone could write code to react to that. Error handling, if something is wrong, if perhaps a function invocation, if an AWS region is down for whatever reason and you cannot access a function, that should also be raised as an event so you could write code to handle that situation. Um, and then just basic kind of company ops situations, maybe a new team member is logged into a service and you want to write some automation to react to that. Uh, all these things, um, this architecture is about pushing the limits as to what we think can be an event and making sure that's accessible to everybody so they can simply write code to react to that. Uh, and remember this, this was all the rage in 2014 and I, I was a big fan. Um, and I don't know what happened, but I just don't hear about it these days a lot. I think um, a lot of other stuff is, is taking up mind share. Uh, but yeah, 23,000 people signed this thing and this was all about building kind of message oriented, decoupled systems um, that were entirely reactive. And the great thing about this right now is that AWS Lambda makes this more possible than ever. Uh, again, it has never been easier, thanks to Lambda, to write code to react to anything that happens. Right? You just write code, you upload it, set it, and forget it. 
And uh, I think we should revisit this goal. And I don't know what these people who signed this are doing today, but um, hopefully they're, they're, they're gonna watch this. Uh, also, what was that uh, event router? Um, our company makes an open source event router for serverless architectures, so you can go check it out right now, uh, github.com slash serverless slash event gateway. Uh, also, you could probably build your own version of this depending on your specific needs with AWS services. You could probably create something like this using API Gateway, uh, using SNS for pub sub functionality, and AWS Kinesis uh, for some sort, sort of storage. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump into a demo real quick. And again, we're gonna try and do a couple things in this demo. This demo is gonna be a basic web application that's designed totally on serverless infrastructure and is de designed to be totally reactive. And with it, we wanna try and simplify that serverless architecture that I showed before. Uh, we wanna try and democratize data. We wanna make sure that these events, again, are accessible easily so anyone could analyze them and act upon them. And with that, we wanna to enable total reactivity. People should be able to just pull in events and write code to react to them. And the, hopefully, the outcome of this is that those teams, those people who are separated by silos can gain access to the information, the data that they need so that they can go take initiative be autonomous and go make things happen. Whether they want to innovate a new feature, uh, whether they want the marketing team wants to do some analysis, whether the operations team needs to handle a failure scenario. Okay, so here's, the, here's a basic serverless architecture for this web application. This is the non-reactive version. Uh, there is a website that's hosted on S3. That website is gonna reach out to, um, well the use case here is a, a sign up form. Basically users just sign up for this thing. There's basic users CRUD on the back end. Um, and that's being saved to a DynamoDB table, and whenever a user um, does anything, it's run, uh, whenever a user, user state is saved in DynamoDB, um, that's passed off to a DynamoDB stream, which a, another Lambda function is listening to, and is routing off that information to SNS, um, which there's a, potentially an analytics function listening to. So basic users CRUD web application, um, with kind of some pub sub involved so that you could write other functions uh, to respond to this. Here is the different version that we're gonna show off today. Uh, this thing just uses uh, the event router. Um, and the website publishes events directly to the event router. Uh, there's really no API, there's no REST API or anything like that. Uh, the website is just sending from the client side, it's just sending, doing HTTP requests to the event router and it's not calling a specific path, uh, it's only using the base uh, path as well as a post method. And in the body, there's a JSON object uh, that is the event that's happening. So on that event router, there are subscriptions. Whenever this event type comes in, user created, um, user updated, user logout, uh, those subscriptions are saved in the event router and uh, those subscriptions bind the event type to specific functions. And I'll show that off in a second. So we're gonna try and recreate the basic user's uh, CRUD backend, um, but also using this piece of infrastructure, uh, the analytics function is just gonna listen in directly to that, that piece of infrastructure. Uh, we're also gonna try and add in some DevOps functions to handle some failure scenarios, uh, and just kind of make this point. Anything is possible with this architecture. All right, here's the demo. Um, gotta thank the, uh, pray to the demo gods, of course. And here we go. All right, <clears throat> here's the, the web application. Um, simple, static website hosted on S3. Uh, you probably come across at least 50 of these this morning when you read the news or did your daily browsing of the internet. Um, again, very simple web application. It's just kind of advertising this architecture. There's a user sign up uh, form here uh, and some simple buttons, but these buttons don't really do anything. I'm gonna open up my console uh, so you could kind of see what's going on in here. So uh, every, this, this client-side app is built in React uh, and Redux, which is also event-driven. And I built some Redux middleware, which is listening in to all the events that are happening on the UI and selectively sending them up to the event router. And the event router, based on the subscriptions for those events that are being sent up, is distributing them to different functions that I provision. On the back end here, uh, I have some basic serverless framework projects. Uh, we have a few different services within this application. First off is a user service, uh, and in here there are three functions. There's a create user function that saves a user to a database, uh, returns a session token. Uh, there's a get user function um, that takes a session, session token and pulls in the user information and an authorization function. Uh, you can see all the events, too, that I'm registering in the serverless framework project. 
um, when you run serverless deploy, all these events get saved to the event gateway uh, so that it knows that it should actually do something with them. And then you can see how the subscriptions are binded up right here. So in this service, there's simply a user create request event that's published to the event router. Uh, the event router then um, calls the create user function and it does it synchronously. This event router is designed to handle subscriptions synchronously and asynchronously. If it's asynchronous, uh, the event router will pass the event to the function uh, and it won't do anything. If it's synchronous, the event router will pass the event to the function and wait for the function to respond and pass the event back through to whoever published it. Um, so two simple subscriptions, but registering a lot of events because I want to make sure other people can access these events and other services. Uh, next up, I have an analytics service. Uh, in here, there's simply one function. This is just a generic tracking function. We want to track uh, user activity. And I set up the subscriptions on these specific users' events. So when I run serverless framework uh, deploy in here, again, it's going to go deploy the function and deploy all these subscriptions. Um, so this track function is going to respond to whenever there's a user vid visited event, user clicked event, or a user logout event. And then lastly, there is the DevOps uh, service here. Uh, this just has one function. It's just called React. It's not really doing anything, but it's. Um, but I'm going to try and make the point regardless. This React function is set up to respond to all types of things that kind of happen in my DevOps world. For example, whenever the framework does a deploy, that's actually published as an event to the event router. Uh, whenever a deployment fail is, fails, that's published as an event. And also the event router itself, it doesn't have normal logs. Instead, it thinks of everything as an event. So it takes those logs, expresses them as events, and publishes those logs back through the event router. So anything that goes wrong in that router uh, is actually an event which you could write code to react to. And I'll show this off right now. So first off, Increase the size here. Here is our basic web application. I'm going to go ahead and sign up. <clears throat> and you can see what's going on right here because I'm logging uh, the events um, to the console. So this client side app published the user create request event. Uh, that went up uh, to the event router. The event router passed that on to a function. The function then saved the user in a database and passed it back. Um, back to the client side. Uh, after, afterwards, um, the, the uh, client side application then published a user created event. It sent that up. <clears throat> so basic kind of back end client side communication. Again, there's no REST API here. The events are just simply being sent up to this event router and based on subscriptions that are set, uh, it's passing them on to different functions. Furthermore, everything that's uh, that the user can do in this application is also expressed as events. So for example, whenever I click any of these buttons, um, events are also being published up to the event router. Uh, the event router is then passing that off to that track function uh, that I showed you all just a few minutes ago. So not only do we get basic backend client-side communication here um, just to make the app work, but now we're tracking all types of user activity. Again, everything is expressed as an event, and as long as you kind of take that philosophy, you could use those events for everything. So these events can be used by your marketing team, by whomever, to start creating services or functions that maybe they just want to send out automated emails to the user. Maybe they want to create a personalized experience on the application. Um, it's up to them. But these events, just by the nature of how this thing is architected, are available for whoever has a creative vision um, to make something happen with them. Whenever someone refreshes uh, and visits, you'll see a user visit event is also published to the event router, um, as well as the user, uh, the user get request event is published up there um, to pull in the user record. And of course, when users log out, um, that's also published as an event. So how the heck do we see all this stuff? Well, we have, for our event router, we have a basic logging experience, so you can see the events uh, coming in. <coughs> And I'll show you the logs in just a second. Okay, here we go. Um, you can see the, the logs coming in, all these different events uh, right here. So for example, here's the user clicked event. I could open this up, um, inspect it. Uh, there's some basic information about the session token that the user used uh, in the event body. Um, and I did a lot of user clicked events. 
Uh, here's the basic user get request event that came in and the user logout event as well. Uh, so you can see all these things kind of are actually be de being delivered to the event router. The event router is logging them. And again, whenever the event router does anything uh, it, uh, and, and emits logs, again, those are expressed as events. And so you can see uh, whenever an uh, event comes in, it also publishes an event received event. Uh, whenever it successfully calls a function, um, it publishes a function invoked event. And even when it's invoking a function, it publishes that. So basic event-driven workflow. Uh, with a lot of stuff, again, back in, uh, client side to back end communication, uh, as well as now we're getting all these, um, all these marketing uh, uh, events, all these user activity events just out of the box. And lastly, I wanna show off the DevOps stuff. Um, so let's do this. In my analytics, um, in my analytics uh, function here, it's pretty simple. It's not really doing anything. Again, you could, build, you could personalize the user experience based off events. You could do send marketing automation, uh, you know, send a notification to your salesperson. Um, but this isn't doing anything yet. However, we're gonna do something interesting and we're gonna create a function that does not work. This function uh, will fail uh, whenever the event router tries to call it. So I'm gonna publish this, um, deploy the new function that throws this error. I believe I saved that file change before I hit deploy. And the reason I'm doing this is because we want to show off how to automate some operations issues. So that function was just deployed, uh, and I can go look at um, this specific event. So again, whenever the event router uh, cannot access a function because the function is down, it publishes this invocation failed event. Again, that is another event that you could write code to handle. Um, so let's just take a look at this and hopefully uh, I did the deployment correctly. Um, but the way the workflow worked is that when the user clicks any button, uh, it's gonna publish a uh, user clicked event. Uh, that is what the uh, tracking function was subscribed to. And again, that tra tracking function does not work. So let's kind of see what happened. I just clicked the user clicked event. I'm gonna re or click button. Then I published the user clicked event and uh, you could see the log showing up right here. So here's the user clicked event. Uh, we received it. Uh, the event router tried to go ahead and call the function, um, but it published this function invocation failed event. Let me refresh, because I don't think I gave it enough time. Um, so one thing we haven't added in here is, is ordering. Um, so observability is, is still a challenge, but it's coming. And here's the user clicked event, <clears throat> here's the invocation failed event, and now what we're looking for is just the react event. And maybe I didn't set up the, maybe I did not save that, so let me try one more time. Demos. All right, let's give this one last shot and then we'll see if it works. All right, so again, that React function is, um, uh, that analytics function is not supposed to work, and it's gonna be triggered by a user clicked event. And. All right, well, it looks like we can't get it to work. And I don't want to try and figure, troubleshoot it in real time. But you could see the basic, um, you could see the basic workflow here. The user clicked uh, the button, that published the user clicked event to the event router, uh, that handed it off to this analytics dev uh, tracking function, and that function did not work. So the event router published this invocation failed event, um, and then I wrote a function to respond to um, the invocation failed event. So. Uh, but that's not showing up here. But what you can do with this is you could write code to handle these failure scenarios. Uh, for example, um, if the AWS, if the region is down in AWS, you could write a function that goes, reconfigures the event router to point to a function in a different region. You could write a function to go send a notification to your DevOps team, say, hey, uh, this isn't working. Um, you could do anything. And that's the goal of this whole architecture. Uh, again, I think we accomplished most of these. Simplify the serverless architecture. Again, there's just like one simple event router that everything is routing through. Uh, democratize data uh, based on kind of the way the serverless framework works and the way just event subscriptions in general work. 
Anyone can reach out to these things and write subscriptions to make something that happens. Uh, and hopefully they use that um, to write, to, um, to build reactive systems and encourage a ton of autonomy. Um, but that's it. If you like the project, you can go check it out. It's open source. Uh, it's not totally finished, um, but I'm gonna share it anyway. So if, you, if you're interested in this, you can go ahead and follow it along. Um, and that's it. So thank you. And I think I could chat about this a bit. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we got one question way in the back. What's the event router? Indeed, it is an open source event router written in Go, um, and it's not called event router, it's called event gateway. Um, and you could, you could run it yourself uh, pretty le easily in Kubernetes. Um, at the last KubeCon, Kelsey Hightower, pretty popular evangelist, did his whole keynote presentation on this, and it was all on running this in Kubernetes. Um, but it's designed to integrate with all types of sources, uh, whether it's webhooks coming from Salesforce, whether it's Kinesis, whether it's Kafka. Uh, you, can, you can get all event data from anywhere and route it to AWS Lambda, you could route it to Kinesis, you could route it to uh, Redshift, uh, but we also have support for other functions across clouds, so Azure functions, Google Cloud functions, and I kind of showed off in that first slide how far we took that. Um, so really the possibilities are, are pretty endless. Um, but yeah, open source, you can run it right now. We have a hosted version, serverless.com, if you want to just start using it uh, without operating it yourself and use the serverless version, um, just go sign up, sign up over there. Yes, sir? A public web page. This thing um, is kind of simply an HTTP server, uh, so you could access it via HTTP. Um, there are different ways you could run it to keep it internal, uh, I think, and it also reaches out, at least via the Lambda integration, it's not calling Lambda through a publicly accessible endpoint, it's calling Kinesis and Redshift and Lambda uh, directly via an IM role. Um, so that stuff isn't exposed as long as the event gateway itself isn't exposed. Yes, sir? Yeah, um, I mean, this is a pretty big vision. Uh, I think the architecture has a ton of possibility. Um, everyone on our team is a huge fan of kind of the event-driven future. Uh, event-driven design has been around for a really long time, but given IoT, given building systems of intelligence that can make decisions on their own autonomously, given serverless compute. Again, it's never been easier to write code uh, to react to something thanks to AWS Lambda. We think events are gonna be a much bigger theme in the future. Um, as far as kind of how this, uh, you know, how this unfolds, uh, you know, we're building some products and some open source projects to help this. Um, additionally, our company is very involved with the CNCF and we came out recently with, um, with a specification called Cloud Events. And we said, look, we think a big ecosystem of tooling and infrastructure can be built for this next generation of event-driven systems, especially serverless event-driven systems. One thing that would really help is if we had a standard for an event envelope that is like consistent metadata for your events. And anyone could leverage this standard. Um, and because the standard exists, you could build for example, uh, event registries, uh, where you could say, okay, I could see the list of my event types that I have to work with and versions and whatnot. This standard is simply some metadata that ships with your event payload. Uh, there's an event type in there, so user created, for example, there's a version in there to help with um, data evolution. Uh, there's an extensions area where anyone could write their own tools to plug in, so there's already a distributed tracing spec for this. Uh, organizations are starting to put their own kind of policies uh, in that metadata as well. And the goal is total um, portability of event data, regardless of the environment that is being transported, um, to help with generic dispatching and routing and processing of the event. Um, and again, because of that stable uh, event envelope, we think that's the foundation that a broader ecosystem of tooling needs um, before it can actually exist. So anyway, if this is of interest to you, uh, we, do, we work on this exclusively in the serverless working group, 9 a.m. every Thursday morning we have a call.
but it's a standards call and it can get pretty long. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you're going to own and operate this yourself, you have to think about that. Um, we, in the hosted version, we are, um, we are building in at least once guarantee. Uh, and um, we're replicating it uh, across different availability zones across all regions in AWS and other clouds. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we took kind of a note from API Gateway. API Gateway has this fantastic feature called Custom Authorizer. That is, you could have a function that has auth logic in it um, that is called before the function containing your business logic is called, right? So that HTTP request comes in, uh, it needs to have some session token or some type of auth, and that's handled by the first custom authorizer function. That custom authorizer function says, yes, this function can, uh, this event can, or HTTP request can proceed or not. Um, and we kind of did the same thing with the event router. So we actually built auth at the event level. Um, and you could see that here within the serverless framework, you just specify your authorizer function um, and register it with the event type. And that means that these events will not go into the event router unless uh, they have some type of auth that is, passes through this authorized function, right? So they will not be handed off to anything that has a subscription to that event in the event router. Yes? Yes, I think the question was um, pulling in a actual some state, a user record. Um, the way that was handled in this is that there's uh, a get user uh, function, um, and there was a subscription. So an event was published from the website, a user get request event. That was published to uh, the event router. The event router looked at that and said, oh, I have a subscription to the get user function, and it handled it synchronously. With that, in that get user function, uh, there is a DynamoDB table uh, containing session tokens, um, and it's going and taking that session token and pulling the user uh, profile and passing that back through the event router and back to the website. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's everything. Thank you all. <laughs>